All right, so this is Michael Sheehan from High Tech Dad, and today I have with me Patrick Carmen, who is one of the authors of the 39 Clues series. He's actually the author of uh, book five called The Black Circle. How's it going, Patrick? It's going pretty good. I was just thinking, I wish I had a copy of it in my hand, which is probably what I should have, but it's my office downtown, and there's lots of books laying around. I just don't happen to have that book lying anywhere in here, but... Yeah, I see plenty of posters back there, so you're you're obviously an established writer. So that's great. So why don't you why don't we just dive right into it and why don't you give me a, a little bit of information about the idea behind the entire thirty nine clues series. I mean, it's obviously going on to like book ten right now. I believe that's that's the impetus for for this this interview. Um, and there are a series of different authors. So why don't you tell me a little bit more? Yeah, let me just I'll give you the quick rundown first about how, how the whole thing works. I mean, I think this kind of thing has become a little more common now. But when this first came out, boy, it was really groundbreaking. When, it, when the series began, um, and be, you know, when you start writing these books, it's you you got to step back like a whole other year when we were actually all talking about doing this. So it's a, it's quite a quite a long time ago when we really got into it. And it's ten books by seven different writers. But what kind of makes it interesting is that there's also collectible trading cards and there's also a, a very elaborate online game that goes along with this. So it's one of those kind of projects where if you have young readers who only like to read, um, reading the books is great. Each book takes place in a different country. They're very sort of fast-paced, fun reads. Um, but if you want that extra piece, if you've got you know, a young reader who loves to collect cards or loves to get online and play games, and that part of it is, is very integrated into the story. Um, the story itself uh, is pretty fun. You, you, you basically imagine yourself showing up at the reading of a will. So somebody has died. And imagine a room with a, a lot more people show up to this thing than, than maybe you would have imagined. So there might be like 100 people in this room. They're all like distantly related to you. And you're given a choice. You can either have a million dollars cash and just walk away and never come back. Or you can have the first of 39 clues. And these two kids, Dan and Amy Cahill, they decide... For you know, you'll have to read it to find out why. But they decide to take the clue, which seems like kind of a dumb idea because a lot of the people basically say, "I'll take the money," and they, they take off. Um, and different groups of people, some that have sort of not great intentions, different groups choose the clue, and that sends them on this worldwide adventure to try and find all thirty-nine clues, which will lead them to something really cool. So I can't tell you what it is. Gotcha. <laughs> and so, so from my understanding, each book is about a different person of historical importance. Um, and I, I guess yours was about uh, Anastasia Roman, Romanoff. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's even even more than that. What I would say is, it's probably less that it's about each book is about a certain someone, as it is. It's like each book takes place in a different country, gotcha. and so my country was Russia. Um, and each each author, you know, each book has a different big area. Some are in Europe, some are uh, in America, and they what that does is it really sort of set up all of us writers to sort of. I don't know, one up each other. At least, at least that's what I was trying to do. I, I felt like when I got Russia, it was kind of like an assignment. It's like, okay, my assignment is to make it really fun and interesting for like a ten-year-old to want to go and check out all this history. And so there were when I was when I started working on the book, I, uh, Anastasia, that she's like that uh, sort of mysterious princess. You know, some people think she may even still be alive. Um, so that was one person they wanted me to weave into the story. Um, what was another one? Um, Rasputin, that sort of guy that, could, that you couldn't kill. You remember that guy? Right. So that was really fun to work on him. Um, and it's also just lots of palaces, monuments. I mean, Russia has got an amazing number of things that are like as big as the Statue of Liberty. They're just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was more about picking the most interesting things and trying to weave them into a, a big mystery story um, that took place in Russia. So did you actually travel out there to do some research? <laughs> was totally. It on Wikipedia. My imagination. <laughs> Very good. That's important. No, I wish that I, I, I could. In fact, I'll, I'll really, to be completely honest, um, I didn't have that much interest in Russia, you know, in the idea of going to Russia when I started writing it. I don't know how, you, how old you are, but I'm, I'm 44. And I do remember, like, when I was in middle school, high school, you know, that was kind of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And Russia was always this place that, I don't know, nobody really thought about going there. It was too dangerous. Right. Um, so for that reason, I, it was pretty cool to kind of really check it out. But by the time I was done, because you do a lot of research with this kind of book, um, I, I really, really want to go there now. Hmm. Um, it's big, and it's kind of like you really have to plan out you know, like where you're going to go. Um, but boy, there's, there's tons of interesting stuff there. And I would, you know, people think, oh, let's go to Europe or we'll go to 
you know, New York or whatever, but there's, there's still a lot of cool history in, uh, in Russia. So I'm, I'm all into it now. Yeah. Actually yeah. half my family's Russian. So oh, you I have to jump ahead in the series and read this one. Yeah. That's fun to write. I probably got something wrong. So uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't email me and tell me I got some piece wrong. <laughs> So, so you know, I have a sort of a question about the the whole series altogether. I mean, did you guys uh, collaborate with the other off- authors as you were mapping out what book would be next and how they all worked together? Were you sort of given a topic list and a way you had to go and, and write about it? Or, or what was sort of the mastermind, you know, or who was the mastermind behind each book? Or is it a, a, a collective thought? Yeah, the mastermind is Harry Potter. Behind right. The back there pulling all the strings. <laughs> you know, um, I was a little nervous at first about getting involved in the project because I didn't know how that was going to go. But there is one one main editor. And the best way I can descri- describe her, she's sort of like an air traffic controller. Mm-hmm. I mean, she really is. There's like we're all sort of doing our own thing, really. We don't really collaborate together very much on these things. It's funny because we'll get together at some events where two or three or four of the authors will get together and we'll all like, then we'll, then we'll like conspire about the series. But really, like for mine, I was right in the middle. So I was the sort of hinge pin book, number five. And so there had been four books before mine, plus a lot of what I guess I would call it like back matter. There was all this material, you know, probably a couple hundred pages of just about the characters and the world of the Cahills and the world of the 39 Clues. And then I read all the books that had been written before mine, some of which hadn't come out yet. Um, In fact, the fourth one was still in sort of outline form when I started writing mine. And then I think I had, if I remember right, I think I only had about three or four pages at the most of actual stuff about what was going to happen in the book that I was going to write. And in fact, it even just said, look, I'd really, the editor was like, look, we really would like to have Anastasia and we kind of like to have, you know, a couple characters and there's some things we kind of like to see happen, but really it's your book. You can do whatever you want. That's great. Um, and yeah, so that really made, made, made it work uh, for me. I didn't want, really want to do this sort of cookie cutter thing. So I, I really focused on the characters that I wanted to, and I did. I just took the story where I where I wanted to take it. Um, there is a certain you know style to that kind of writing. It is very um, you know Rick Riordan wrote the first one. He's got a certain kind of oomph to his writing. It's very fast paced and, and accessible. And so I think we all sort of tried to uh, align to that a little bit. I, I write like that anyway. Um, but uh, but for the most part, we were given a lot of freedom, and we all were to write kind of what we wanted to write. That's great. So, so you had said that you can read the series on its own. You know, you don't need to do the other online or trading card aspects. But so, what what do the, what does the online environment and the the trading card add to the mix? Yeah, it just I guess what I would say is it sort of it, it enriches the experience sort of dramatically. I mean, really, the books um, they're designed to to be read and not put anything else with them, like, like I said. And that's so for certain people, and a lot, I think a lot of readers, I mean, I think there are about 10 million books in print, and there are about a million registered users at the at the game site. So, you know, maybe I think that that doesn't mean that there aren't other kids who aren't registering, but maybe two, three, four kids out of 10 are really getting just immersed in the game part of it. Um, and the rest are probably reading the books. Some of the cards um, come with, with some of these books, and some of them you can get as card packs separately. And what those do is you take those online to the game. There are hundreds of cards. They're, they're really cool. Um, and they have certain code numbers on them. And you put those into the game, and it unlocks certain aspects of the story. So uh, there are 39 clues. But there, a lot of people have said to me, well, are there going to be 39 books? <laughs> it's a pretty long series. Be like, yeah, it but there's not. There's only 10 books. So, so there, there's one clue released in each one of the books. And then the other 29 clues, it's kind of like if you get into the game, you become a character in the story yourself, and you go out and you find those other 29 clues. So every time a new book comes out, they release these uh, additional missions that you can do online where you go on you sort of, you go on a clue hunt to find out more. So there, and there's lots of fun little games you can play, like, you know, what I would describe as like Twitch games, like Bejeweled, that sort of thing. There's, you know, tons of those, and great place to hang out and just learn about history and learn about these historical characters. Huh, it's a great mixture. Um, so do you know, like, uh, are parents reading these to their kids, or is it more the kids picking them up? You know, based on the age range and the topic matter, um, how how are uh, families working with the the series? Yeah, you know, I think that really depends on on uh, the dynamic of every family. I mean, we I have a thirteen year old and a fifteen year old, and we we still read out loud to our kids sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really depends on what kind of, you know, um, cult, the sort of family dynamic there. Um, but I think it's pretty, pretty broad. I think a lot of kids are reading these on their own. 
Um, I think it falls into that category where it's a really fun read aloud for, you know, an adult to read to like a six or seven year old because it's just a big adventure and they can learn a lot of history. And it kind of there's some good humor in these books, too, I think. And I think it holds a young reader's attention pretty well. So great read aloud. Um, and I like, for example, for me, my daughter really likes she actually likes gaming. She's all into the Sims and stuff like that. Um, and so we'll go on and play each other on the games uh, pretty frequently. And she's she beats me pretty much every single time. I, there's, a, there's a couple of games that I keep really trying to get better at, but it just doesn't matter. She always beats me in these games. So it can be kind of a fun thing to like. It, maybe that gaming aspect of it you know, draws uh, a parent and their, and their kid to maybe want to uh, play a game that sort of revolves around reading. I mean, I think that's great. That's They're going to play video games anyway. Why not uh, attach it to a, a book that's going to make them want to find out more about the story? So. Yeah, so I mean, uh, that was going to be one of my questions. If if you were a dad, because that's you know important to me and my audience, um, did any of the inspiration of of uh, things in the book come from you being a parent and and you know working the characters that way? Well, I mean, I look. I've been to about a thousand schools, <laughs> and my kids are right around that age. I have kids, one in middle school and one in high school. And as much as we have, I mean, we've drilled reading into them the love of reading since they were little. Um, and even for them, boy, with all the distractions, you know, of cell, I think the cell phone is when it really kicks in big, big time for, for young, for young people. I mean, computers and TV and, and uh, video games and all that, that's one thing. But as soon as they have this mobile thing in their pocket that they can constantly be turning to, I think it really does, it's very disruptive when it comes to getting just quiet time to read. Um, and so I guess my feeling is anytime we can figure out a way to meet young readers halfway and show them that we really do understand where they're coming from. And I see that with my own kids. It's like, look, I, I'm trying to create projects and be part of projects where um, tools are in place that allow you to bring your tech and bring your videos and bring your stuff into the reading experience in a way that's meaningful for you. Yep. So I would just say that my, you know, and you'll get, you said you have kids too that are kind of getting, they're sort of bumping up to that age. And they get, you know, 12, 13, 14, it really, it really is a fundamental shift where tech really starts to, to drive out reading. And I think... There's certainly a place for traditional books, and it's a huge part of a, a young person's reading experience. But finding ways to sort of bridge that gap and, and be smart, being smart about it as writers and parents, I think, is, is important, too. So Projects Like 39 Clues really fill that gap. Yeah, yeah, and I must admit, I've only read like the first half of the first book, but I was impressed by how it started out. It seemed like it was going to be very old school and set back in like the twenties or something like that, or even earlier. And then all of a sudden, it was it was modern and and current. And and for me, I, I saw that as being a, a perfect attraction for the young reader, you know, to bring it into modern day and and that sort of thing. And then by you know coupling in the on site or, or the online element and you know interactive um, element of it, I think I think it could go a long way. So that's great. Um, By the way, Michael, if you want to, you can just skip to book five. It's it's the best <laughs> one. Anyway. But you just probably just read that. Read read five. Read half of one. Read five and read ten. There you go. There you go. Don't tell anybody I said that. You can just cut that out. <laughs> so uh, I understand that the, there have been some movie rights given to DreamWorks. So um, are we going to be uh, seeing a, a movie coming down the line for like book one sometime? You know, I wish that I could uh, lie and tell you all that, that these great facts that I have about the movie rights. Um, that's the thing about these movie rights. You just never know. Right. I mean, I know that uh, DreamWorks acquired the rights. I know that Steven Spielberg has said in print that he's interested in being a part of that project, possibly even directing it. Um, is it Jeff Nathanson, the guy who wrote Catch Me If You Can, um, is writing or has written a screenplay, a treatment? So there are some big names and some big people around it, and that, that's very, very helpful. And the, the project has been very popular for, for a long stretch. So I think the chances are, are pretty good that it'll get made into a movie. But who am I? Just sitting at the wall, wall. How do I know about these things? I probably know less than you do, but uh, it would be fun. I tell you, I, I, I love movies, and I think when, when books get made into movies, it just it ex expands the audience, and more kids want to read the books, and I think that's great. That's great. So if you have a few seconds, tell me about some of the other uh, books that you've written. Wow, thanks. I, uh, yeah, I read a lot of books for Scholastic. So, um, and some of what I do is, is along these lines, where I have these multimedia projects that are that are pretty pretty elaborate, a little different. Mine are more what I would call a book and a movie at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so there's one series called Skeleton Creek. So if you have about a 
12, 13 year old, 11, 12, 13 year old who likes something a little bit scary. There's nothing like terrible in these books, but it's got a lot of those sort of little, if you've ever been online on YouTube and seen one of those little fright videos, it's a lot of that kind of stuff. Gotcha. And what they'll do is they'll read uh, a book from one character's perspective where they'll read maybe 20, 30 pages, and then they'll come to a page that's blank except for a, uh, a web address and a password. And you'd set the book down, you'd go online, you put in the password at that website, it unlocks, you actually watch part of the, the story unfold, like two or three minutes. And there are nine different videos. So what that's been, what's been great about a project like that is that for a lot of kids who are very distracted, particularly boys, a lot of times who just really don't want to read for pleasure, um, it gives them a little carrot. You know, so they, if they can just get through 20 or 30 pages, they get to watch part of the story. Um, and it usually tends to be something sort of that makes them sort of scream and then laugh their heads off. So, so that's been good. That's great. Um, and there's another uh, series called Trackers, uh, which is the same kind of thing, only it's a spy novel. So it's kind of like... What do we call it? Like Goonies with gadgets, but it's got it's got little movie parts too. So it's just again a way to sort of provide like a little link to get kids connect to their with the world they're living in and give them a reason to want to come back to always always turning pages. That's always the goal. Great. So I guess my last question is, uh, where can people who are interested in this series find out more information about the Thirty Nine Clues? Okay. Yes, yeah, Glossy does a very very good job of not only immersing young readers in the game part of it, but the the just the launch page. Uh, for that, which is the number 39 uh, in the word clues. So 39clues.com. I mean, it's a perfect place to start. You find out about all the books, everything that's going on. And if you want to pl- go deeper, that's where, you, that's where you do that too. Great. Any last words for you here? Well, if you want to find out more about uh, that book, the, my book, the fifth one, or other things that I've written, you can just go to my name. That's just patrickcarman.com, and it's all, all there. Uh, but really, I always like to, to uh, sing the praises of Scholastic at these moments because really – they were the first ones to take a, this was a very risky project. I mean, as you might imagine, and when you go online and see the games, you'll realize this is a, it was an expensive uh, risk for them to take. And they really put it all out there to get great world-class writers and to put a big program into play to reach Wired Kids. And I just am very thankful for, for them because they, you know, they didn't have to do that. And uh, they really led in an area that need, we needed some leadership. Um, but you know what? If you're a kid and you're summer looking for summer reads or whatever, uh, these are great. These 39 Clues books are they're great fun, uh, big adventures, and you learn a little bit about history. That's the boring part, but it totally works. So uh, I just hope kids jump in and try it. Great. Well, Patrick, thank you very much for the time here. And uh, I guess great. Well, thank you. I love, I love your. I was actually checking out your site. I think it's cool. I'm going to start going there. Great. Great. Well, I appreciate it. So this has been uh, Michael Sheehan from HighTechDad.com, and I've been interviewing uh, Patrick Carmen from book number five of uh, The 39 Clues. Thanks a lot, Patrick. All right. Thank you.